Okay, well that was a flurry. Um, good afternoon, good, no, good morning. I don't even know what time it is anymore. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a departure from my normal work. Um, I'm actually talking about uh, legal and ethical regulations for autonomous robotics. Um, my everyday job actually involves um, working with controls and formal verification. Um, this is completely out of left field. It's work that uh, I presented at IROS last year. They had no idea where to slot us because there are no equations. It's sort of a thought piece. Um, I found I, I, had a, I feel a little dirty not having any equations in here. Um, but this actually came about because I um, was having dinner with a room full of lawyers and um, we sort of got to talking about um, engineering and ethics and all the interesting questions that you and I have probably thought about, like how do you design robotic robots um, and systems that are ethical, um, how do you deal with the trolley problem, for instance, and the lawyers just sat there and said that is completely uninteresting whatsoever, um, and that's actually not really what we think about at all. And so um, I sort of went and delved into the literature in terms of what what sort of the legal field really thinks about, and it turns out they don't really understand a lot of engineering and science. Um, and I went and sort of delved into the field in robotics and in engineering. It turns out we don't really understand a lot of legal issues, um, technically, um, uh, as well as they do. And so this is kind of a, a, a think piece um, about what is sort of in our future in terms of um, legal ethical regulations for autonomous robotics. Um, I do have a poster session tomorrow um, that talks a little bit more about learning enabled components or, or how do we deal with the <coughs> components that have machine learning components to it. Um, but that's not this one. This is kind of a, a, a thought piece on this. So um, there will be no solutions in here. This is kind of a posing some problems and some ideas about how to think about this thing. Um, and then I'll take questions. Okay, so, so the wording definition of autonomy in how we're thinking about this is that at its core, it's a process of designing or regulating systems that make choices based off, um, not on sort of in explicit human intervention, but on preconceived decision rules. Lots of big words, but we sort of claim that there's, um, there's sort of uh, autonomous systems, uh, large systems or small systems, or... <laughs> I'm sorry? Is that the lawyer's definition? That's the lawyer's definition. That's not my definition. There's too many too many words with um, a lot of syllables that and no um, acronyms for a okay, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> um, yeah, he knows my words well. So, um, so anyway, so also a uh, disclaimer because I work with lawyers. Um, these photos are all pulled from the internet and not credited, so please don't share this with anyone. Um, <laughs> okay, so these are just some examples of the sort of autonomous systems, I put this in quotes, that we see um, and interact with in our daily lives already. So we have Amazon Alexas are pretty prevalent. Self-driving cars are out there everywhere. If you live in specific states, you'll see them all over the place. Um, and I work quite a bit with a lot of these particular drones, not these particular drones, but somewhat similar drones to these. Um, and so this is the working definition of autonomous robotic systems. And so um, the question that we kind of came up with was, was, given the number and diversity of autonomous systems or autonomous close to autonomous systems that already exist, um, and their pre-existing regulatory environments, again, blurry definition, but we already have existing structures for how we do with complex systems. Does it make sense now um, to think about an overarching autonomy law? Um, you know, we sort of think about who's going to, how do we deal with insurance? How do we deal with liability? Um, maybe we need a new branch of autonomy law to deal with us um, that's applicable to different domains. Um, and we posit that we actually don't need to do that, so we say no. Um, trolley problems are nice, intellectual exercises, but it turns out that we already have a structure and a framework to deal with these types of challenges. We just need to actually go and uh, explicitly deal with them. Okay, so the, the key point is that autonomy regulation is both system and regulator specific. You can't um, delve into it as an overarching branch, but you need to think about it uh, depending on um, where it sort of sits in the field. Um, complex systems, autonomy within complex systems is nothing new. We have it already within the aerospace system. We have it already within our cars. All of your cars, unless they are very, very, very old, um, will have some sort of automated system within it. Your braking systems, for instance, um, your computer systems are all uh, very complex things that are highly regulated, or more or less regulated, depending <coughs> on the field itself. Um, so. On the right are just three particular examples in the legal field about how these complex systems have already been regulated. Um, flight guidance systems are done in a specific way. FDA approvals are done in a specific way. None of this is new. Um, 
uh, our UAS test site, for instance, deals with the whole certification process for how do you get unmanned air systems um, uh, to be certified to be safe to be flown um, in, within um, a particular airspaces. So uh, this is already sort of being done as it is. So the idea here is that um, different fields, depending on what field you work in, will have different ways of governing things because there are different relative risks involved and different benefits to the system. Um, and in certain cases, because they kind of evolve separately, um, there's, that, there's sort of relative inertia um, and path dependency. So within the legal field, I learned that path dependency is not what we think of as path dependency. Um, path dependency here just means they've, they've from, for some historical reason, they've started in a particular way and they kind of go in their own uh, way. And there's, that, there's no energy topics involved in them. Okay. So, for instance, consumer electronics, your Alexas, your smartwatches, um, your smartphones even, um, they, uh, most things are allowed unless they're affirmatively banned. So sometimes you would never go and update your, soft, your phone software um, you would never be the first one to update your phone software because I guarantee you there's always going to be a bug or two. Um, so you wait a few weeks at least, or I certainly do, before um, patches come in so that you can actually go and, and do it without any major interferences um, because the stakes are relatively low. Uh, there's a bug in your Alexa, okay, fine. Um, your lights don't turn on quite exactly at the same time. It's not a big deal. Within the aviation industry, however, much bigger deal, um, autonomous devices or, or sort of software needs to be um, specific things need to be prohibited unless there are specific approvals for it and you can show that it's safe. Within the medical field, things need to be approved and not only that, but they need to show efficacy before they can actually be used because the stakes are much higher than that. And each of these fields, again, have their own path dependency. They come up with their own regulatory structures um, well uh, uh, when sort of the fields first evolved. So there's no one single approach to autonomous regulation that's divorced from the context of the systems that they're trying to get. Um, okay, so you might ask, what about ethics? What about, um, I love talking talk about the trolley problem, so what about the trolley problem? What about um, thinking about these grand schemes of what we're doing? Um, it's important, it's an interesting question, but it's an academic exercise as opposed to what we can actually really do. The real questions are more, you know, in the sort of evidence of data or sampling bias. Um, you know, there's these videos of, of these, um, of the automated soap dispensers that work if your skin is lighter, but it doesn't actually work if your skin is darker because it doesn't show that. So these are the types of ethical, moral questions that are more relatable as opposed to, well, if you have two people here and 10 people here, how does the car work? So those are the larger questions that don't quite apply. So that's kind of what's going on. Okay, <laughs> so the, in the, the sort of question of liability, um, like, you can think about liability involving two dimensions. So allocation, who is actually liable, and then the degree of liability, so higher or low. So something like um, uh, a, a smart device, an Alexa, would, would um, have very low liability. Um, so the question about whether the user is responsible versus the manufacturer is responsible um, could sort of somehow fit within the, the sort of bottom region, but doesn't really quite matter. If, for instance, a Tesla's autopilot malfunctions, um, if the use, if it's found out that the user um, drove it purposefully into a tree, um, the user is responsible. But but anything other than that, um, most of the time, the manufacturer is responsible. So I initially thought this was an interesting question that lawyers would like to pose and think about. But really, for them, there is going to be some equilibrium uh, eventually. Someone's going to be liable, most likely the manufacturer, if they can sh show that they did not purposefully, willfully uh, uh, do poor work, um, uh, they, will, uh, they will still be responsible um, because there's, I don't remember the legal term for it, but they are usually responsible for these types of things, um, unless the user does something very, very stupid. Um, but either way, all that to say, there is some equilibrium that will happen. It's a not quite interesting question that, for them to answer who is actually going to be responsible. The insurance companies will end up paying out whatever it's going to be, but it's some particular question, and then they solve it, and then they sort of move on to that. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay. I'm going to skip this. <coughs> so there's sort of two approaches to regulatory safety. Um, most applications have both of these in one particular way or another. There are technology-based standards and there are performance-based standards. So a technology-based standard could be something like um, 
all cars need to have a catalytic converter. Um, a performance-based standard means that your entire system needs to perform to some particular threshold level. Um, so both of these things are already done, and both of these things should be continued. Now, the interesting question is, at what what, what are your limits and what particular combinations of these approaches should be used for your particular application itself. And so here's just sort of an a initial sketch about how we, should, we can think about government regulation or the level of government regulation versus the type of criteria. Um, medical devices need to be both safe and effective and high regu highly regulated because of the importance of it um, and all that. Okay, so overall conclusion. No real solutions posed, no equations here. Um, but the idea is that regulation for autonomous systems is going to be field specific. We're not going to have an overarching autonomy law or set of regulations, but you really do need to think about technology-based standards and regulation-based standards um, as, a, as a whole. Okay, I will take any questions. Yes. I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> he doesn't need a mic. <laughs> because knowing what you do, I would see some attempt to, in, to include some rules and formalities in, into the, uh, into going towards some sort of standard and allow, of course, some free space. But uh, we cannot let the lawyers uh, control this, because I'll give you an example. Don't take this personally. I, I was in, uh, in California, and I was working with Qualcomm, and we saw the autonomous cars and they were all proud about how well they were doing. And then I went to the lab, and uh, I looked at the car, and I opened the luggage compartment, and it was full of hard drives. And I asked the person who was doing the experiments how much of the data they collect, because they have this camera on top that goes like this, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, how much of this data are you, you using? And he said, less than 1%. And I said, why the heck do you have it over there? And the answer you can guess, right? It's because without it, the insurance companies will not give them a license to put the car on the street. Mm. So we have to get involved here. And I, 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 on the positive side of your talk, I, I, I am happy that you are getting involved. But there has to be an attempt, like it, it has been in medicine and it's gaining, and to put some of the things that we know they're bad into rules. Yes. And this will involve formal systems. <coughs> and then whether I, the lawyers like it or not, then we'll go to court and fight. But we cannot just leave it open because of the, word, the boring, very simple uh, statement, which every lawyer will accept. There's no uh, universal law. The law is always interpreted, which means any yeah, lawyer can have a And you yeah. cannot let the engineering system be like that. I agree. No, that's actually... Thank, uh, you, though, for, really thank you, though, for getting into the field. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually going to be our continuing work. Um, this is sort of an initial put our foot in the door kind of thing, but that's a good point. Any other questions? One last question. I gotta look all the way. Just hold on. We should have a hundred mics. Um, I was just curious to know uh, what is your take on the ethics and regulations relating to humanoid robots? To human humanoids. Humanoid robots, in terms of uh, their personal rights or. Uh, Ethics, safety, um, it's just like an open-ended question, which I'm... Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about that particular field to really give a good answer. I can give you what I think and what I sense in that um, I think there are existing structures that, that can regulate it from a performance-based standard, um, meaning do no harm to humans, um, uh, there can only be certain sort of amount of force that, that the robot can sort of exert and must stop when it sort of senses some particular thing. Um, these types of regulations are already out there. Um, in terms of the technology-based standards, meaning what exactly that force needs to be or any of those things, I actually don't know. That's, that's a good question. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you.